hope will bring faith and, and hope into our hearts about what it is that God uh, wants to do, in fact, is doing. And in fact, for many of you, it'll be the types of things that have been in your hearts for a long, long time. Uh, now that you found Joel chapter 2, would you stand with me for the reading of the scripture? The 7 o'clock tonight, if God lets us, I hope he does, we're just going to have a, we're going to have a, a celebration. We're going to shout and dance about and lay hands on people and God's going to come down and it's going to be fun. And so I want you to be here. I hope it'll be fun. Lord, let me have fun tonight. Because <laughs> I don't this morning. Joel chapter 2 verse 12. And I'm reading this out of the King James. Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn you even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. And rend your heart, and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and, and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord. Give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Would you pray this with me? Heavenly Father, Open my heart that I may hear what you would say to me. Change my life. Make me more like Jesus. In his precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Let me give you the back ground, backdrop of this. And I will, uh, I will tell you before I say that, that um, I was really glad they had the, op the opportunity to start the testimony. And I know that really is the strong point, the forte of four gospel businessmen to come together and hear the stories of what it is that God's done in our lives. With the conviction that if God's done it in my life, He'll do it in your life. Or if God did it in their life, He may do it in my life. It's a wonderful ministry. But I was glad to be able to start there because I wanted to try to establish uh, a bit of the connection in terms of our connection with the nation of New Zealand and kind of the work of the Spirit of God in our lives bringing us to this particular moment and hopefully to establish a relationship as well with you. When we were here in 1999, that very first time for what uh, was, I thought, just to attend a conference, I think I, my wife and I probably owned the record of having traveled the farthest to simply attend uh, a conference at least for that particular ministry. And uh, that's all I thought we were going to be doing in the nation was just attending this conference. God has a wonderful way of not telling you things. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff. If he told you the whole story, you wouldn't sign up. You would say, Lord, just if you don't mind, just bless my neighbor, Lord. You know, just use him. You know, God, here am I, use Joe. You know, I mean... Uh, that sort of thing. But uh, God didn't tell us that. He just simply said, I want you to go. Made it really clear, in fact, that we were to go. I remember on that trip just weeks before, we had uh, we bought the tickets, had no money. And, uh, and some of you understand that. You've been there. And bought the tickets. I had, had no idea how I was going to pay for the tickets. And uh, we, had, we were speaking some meetings at a church, and we had one night that was to be a rest night, and somebody showed up on rest night and wanted to talk to me. And so I spent the night sitting outside of our caravan and getting eat up by mosquitoes and talking to this guy about his marriage problems and you know and ministering to him and feeling like wow man I really needed this night to rest and uh, and walked into the services the next day and this gentleman who who I talked to the night before you know and I'd seen his car it was this all beat up banged up you know beater of a thing and before the service he walked up to me and he said uh, God told me to give you this and he handed me an envelope 
Now, I don't want to be offensive when I say this, but you know, I've traveled since 1984. I, I speak an average of probably 225 times a year, and I've been handed a lot of envelopes, poems that should have never seen the light of day, and you know, and, and, and stuff. You know, and I've been given some really good stuff, but I've been given a lot of stuff. It's like, God, how how can I be kind and how can I be gracious? You know. But, uh, but this guy handed me this envelope and said, God said to give you this. And I said, thank you. And I dropped it in my briefcase and went into the service. And after the meeting, we had missionary friends who were in the meeting that night. And so we were going to go out with them and get a bite to eat after the meeting, as you often do. And, uh, and as we were getting ready to leave, I said, oh, I said, somebody gave me an envelope. Let me see what's in it. And I opened the envelope. And, uh, and inside that envelope were 30 $100 bills. Now, my airfare was exactly... $3,000. And I heard the Lord say, I'm in this thing. You know, you, you are going, you know, the guy never gave me anything before. In fact, I've never seen the guy since then. I've never heard from him since then. And when I met him, I thought he had to be impoverished. I found out uh, later that he was, you know, he drove that car because he liked it. And, uh, you know, finances were not an issue in his life. You know, he had other issues, but finances was not one of them. And so it was a setup trip from the beginning. And uh, when we came to the end of the conference, and, and I told you a bit of that story, and, uh, and so we were coming back in 2000 for what I thought would be six weeks. And while we were on the flight, the Lord began to speak to my heart very clearly. You know, some people, I listen to them, and I get the impression God speaks to them really, really clearly every day of their lives. I wish I could say that. God doesn't talk to me quite that often. In fact, I asked him once something, and he said to me, did I, did I already tell you what I wanted you to do? I said, yes, sir. He said, have I told you anything else? I said, no, sir. He said, what's the problem? <laughs> you know, you know, just like, yeah, giving you the assignment, just go do it. You know, and when I want you to do something else, I'll let you know. And so um, he kind of talks to me in, in those sort of ways. I think he figures I understand you know, that communication. So I'm on the flight, and the Lord began to speak to me, and he said, um, I have a word for you to give to New Zealand. And I said, Lord, uh, I don't really do words for nations. You know, I, I just preach sermons and speak to congregations, and I don't have a platform to give a word to a nation, and I don't have any. And then he told me what it was you want me to say, and I said, Lord, I don't have any authority to say that. And, uh, but he, he wouldn't let it go. And, uh, and so I, I, I avoided it for a year. I would kind of hint at it occasionally. And I argued with God for the entire six months. We were in New Zealand in 2000 about that word, and he wouldn't let it go. In 2001, he really put the pressure on me to begin to share it. And so I did for a while, and, uh, and then it got to a point I said, you know, Lord, I really like to play the more than one string on the guitar. <laughs> you know, there, there are other strings, God. There are other messages. I really would like to, I like to do one of those others. And, um, and I, I attended a, a meeting, and, and Graham Simpson, where are you at? I, that's where I think where you and I met. And uh, David Wilkerson, who recently went to be with the Lord, was, uh, was one of the speakers at that particular event. And, uh, and what he would not have known, and nobody else in the room would have known, uh, David Wilkerson probably has had a significant impact on my life as probably top three uh, ministers in the world that impact upon my life. And uh, so I'm sitting there in the very, very first session. And Graham, I don't know if you remember what he opened his session with, that very first session, but I will never forget it. Because he opened in the first five minutes and he said something to this effect. I'm going to share a word with you here today that I have never shared anywhere else in the world. He said, this is not a message I've given to any other nation. This is a message, he said, you can receive as a word from God for New Zealand. And then he proceeded in the next three to four minutes to share with that congregation the exact words that God had given me a few years earlier. Now, at that moment, I'm sitting there feeling two things. A, terrified. I spent a lot of my life. Somebody told me once, they said, you know, we don't know very many people that they walk to the pulpit and they have a greater sense of confidence and assurance of, of what it is that God is saying and doing in the meeting than you. I thought, boy, I fake it really well, don't I? I said, because I walked the most pulpits on the sheer edge of terror. And saying, you know, and, and, and I've had so many meetings, a leader would say, well, we don't know what to do next, so here, the service is yours. <laughs> and I'm, I'm thinking, 
I don't know what to do either, you know, but somewhere between that chair and the pulpit, Lord, I really hope that you give us a, a sense of direction. And so I'm sitting there and I'm hearing him say this thing that God had said to me, and I know that probably there was nobody on the face of planet Earth that God could have used to have said that word that would speak more directly to my heart. Now the pastor of the church that we had preached with for so many weeks in 2000 was sitting down the road from me and he just leaned over and he looked at me. And he said to me, uh, where have I heard that before? And so I've heard the Lord say, you're not done sharing that. It's a message I only preach in New Zealand. I never tried to preach this anywhere else because it's not a word for anywhere else. And so it's a word I believe God has given us and I hope to do it justice. Most of it, I'll probably stay pretty close to my notes because uh, I know what it is the Lord said to me specifically, and I want to be as specific as I can be with what He said. And then I'm going to interpret. And that which He said specifically, I will, I will stake my life. That was a word from the Lord. The interpretation, you're free to disagree with. Okay, the application, whatever you want. But, uh, but I will show you what I sense the Lord said. And it came in two phrases. First phrase was simply this, own your own revival. Tell New Zealand to own their own revival. And the second thing he said was, rend your heart. Tell them I cannot rend the heavens until they rend the heart. Let me work my way through those two phrases. The first phrase, own your own revival. I don't think I have too much difficulty really grasping what the Lord was saying on that. I believe it includes the thought of not looking to someone else nor somewhere else for what God is going to do in this nation. My wife and I continue to be on a learning curve as we travel in New Zealand. But one of the things I began to learn fairly quickly was that New Zealand is pretty good at picking up what somebody else is doing and improving on it. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of what we do. And, um, and you'll see it in, in church life. You'll see it in the religious community. Because wherever you go in New Zealand, you find an expression of a church that exists somewhere else. You find Hillsong. In fact, not to be offensive, but in my first year, I began to wonder if it was possible Insist, do not be offended with what I'm going to say, okay? But I began to wonder if it was possible for there to be a worship team that did not have a blonde lady <laughs> in a black outfit. <laughs> you know, I mean, Hillsong had made a huge impact. And you had Hillsong worship and Hillsong churches and and you could look around in New Zealand and you would find your, um, your Bill Hybel churches. You'd find your Rick Warren churches. You would find your Toronto churches. In fact, you could pretty much name the poison that you wanted to name. And you would find somewhere within this nation those who had bought into that. Now that's not necessarily wrong. There's nothing negative on any one of those. But it does sometimes reflect a sense that what God's going to do is going to come from the outside. And I would often discover that there would be this expectation that somebody would come in from outside of the nation and, and they would be the one that would instigate and revival would begin with them. In fact, I remember a particular ministry a few years ago coming through the nation and, and they were doing meetings in a number of cities throughout, and I won't give you the name, but it's a very, very legitimate ministry. And they were seeing a lot of people getting saved. And I remember somebody in, here in, in this area, in Hutt Valley, said to me, do you think this is that which God is going to use to bring revival into the nation of New Zealand? And I said, nope. And I said, wrong horse. I said, nothing against the ministry. I said, it's a great ministry. It's a great evangelistic tool. I said, God will use them. A lot of things are going to happen. I said, but the revival will not come from the outside. It will come from the inside. Now, that does not mean that we cannot learn from others. Foolish is the individual who does not learn from others who have been down a journey. There's no reason for us to repeat somebody else's mistakes. 
You know, I, I make enough of my own. I don't really need to just repeat what somebody else does. But So if we can learn from others who are on the journey, then that's a, a, a smart individual who learns from others. God is not going to take what He's done in the States, or all due respect to Rob, what God's done in Australia, and duplicate that in New Zealand. What He wants to do in this nation will have a distinctive Kiwi flavor. It will reflect who this nation is. Now, when the Lord began to press that upon me, my next statement to him was, then why am I going to New Zealand? <laughs> uh, because that seems to me to be counterproductive. <laughs> you know, if you're saying revival is going to come from within the nation, then why am I on this plane? Because it seems to me like I'm spending a lot of money and I'm sitting on very uncomfortable seats <laughs> to go do something I'm going to have nothing to do with. I said, you know, I could just, you know, I could just stay here to be a... And I will tell people, I, I really don't have all of that worked through, just this awareness that God's made it clear that a part of the journey of our life is to include this nation, and I'm grateful to God for that. But the revival will not come from outside. What God's going to do in your chapter will not come from outside. What God's going to do in your community will not come from outside. You see, every revival of significance in church history... As you begin to analyze them, you discover there's something from within. Now, there may be voices that God uses to come from other places, but the essence, that, that which is the real ingredient that God draws upon, is that which has come from within. Many of you have been praying for and believing God for revival for many of your lives. For some of you, it's become even a thing of becoming a bit weary in well-doing. I said, I think I mentioned this the other night. I sat with a leader of one of the denominations in this nation. And, and he said to me, the tears in his eyes and the frustration in his voice. Uh, 35 years I've been hearing this. And he said, it seems to me we're nowhere near closer than we were. And I can relate to the frustration of that. And I can only be encouraged as I begin to realize that sometimes God measures time a bit different than I do. And. When God says, now, it also doesn't take him as long as it takes me. But I believe you said, on your own, it will come not from outside, it will come from within. It also suggests to me then, and this is an application, that I can't look to somebody else. At some point, I have to take personal responsibility. That I cannot look for somebody else to do my praying for me. I cannot look to somebody else to do my witnessing for me. I cannot look to somebody else to pay the price uh, that I will have to pay for what I want to see God do. I, I mentioned the other day that I was challenged as a young man to give at least one hour a day in prayer. For many, many, many years I did that. And then the Lord spoke to me one day and said to me, you know, there are certain things you're asking me for and things you want to see me do. He said, I just want to tell you that one hour a day is not going to be enough. And he reminded me that as a very young man, he had asked me to tithe my day in prayer. And that that was to be, and, and that was not to be obligatory upon anybody else. It was not to be, you know, condemning. It was simply with God to, this is what I want you to do. You tell me that this is what you want to see. He said, I'm telling you that if you're going to see that, then you need to be prepared to do this. Now, I don't understand all the reasons for that. I know there's intensification of spiritual warfare. I know there's stuff that has to take place in our hearts that comes out of the times we spend with the Lord. But I know that at some point I have to own my own revival. And that means individually as well, friend. I cannot blame anybody else for my spiritual condition. That I am, at the end of the day, I am responsible for my own spiritual well-being. That means I cannot blame my mom and my dad. They made me go to church when I was a kid. I bet they also made you wash behind your ears. I bet they also made you eat brekkie when you didn't want to. Isn't it interesting how Satan uses some lines in our lives? I have to own my own revival. I have to take personal responsibility. You see, if we do not take personal responsibility... In this nation, for this nation, who will? If I do not take personal responsibility for the region that I'm in, for the city that I live in, for the chapter that I'm a part of, 
for the neighborhood that God has placed me in. If I do not take responsibility for that neighborhood, then who is it that God will give the burden to for that place? There is a reason, sir, that you live where you live. There's a reason that you work where you work and the business that God has given to you. It's not just to put food on the table. It's not just to have a shelter. But it's because there's people and things that God wants you to do in that situation. Personal responsibility. I have to embrace that. It's a part of, may I suggest, mature Christian living, but certainly a part of revival. The embracing of what it is that God is going to ask me In the revival that God... You see, there are many who, they want God to send revival, but they don't really want to do anything. Send it, God. I'll just sit here and wait for it to come. Hallelujah. (laughs) I've watched it. You know? Uh, you know, I went through a season, if I, if, I could, if I could say it this way, in the 2000 meetings where in Hutt Valley, where we saw 800 people respond to an altar call in 20 weeks. And just night after night after night, people were getting saved and awesome stuff was happening. And, and there's this sense of expectation. It's, it's going to explode in the valley. And I remember 2001, a prophetic word about, you know, this being the season and, and just this intense. But what I also noticed is there was some, not everybody, but there were some who were saying, God, we're expecting revival and we'll sit right here until it comes. And the realization, the fact is this, if you sit right there, he probably is passing by on the other side. And you just missed what it was he was doing. And finally they begin to understand, yes, God is going to send revival, but there's ownership. There's responsibility. There's a part that I have to play. Now one of the challenges, and I'm getting there, I'm not quite as far down the road as some in this room. I'm farther than Jimmy is. <laughs> I'm, um, I've probably got less years to go than I've already been. <laughs> yeah. And you start, you, start, um, you start measuring things a little differently. And so I said, God, I, I, want to, I want the time I have left to count. You know, I, I want to do something that has value to it. But I don't really, and, and I don't have any issues with people retiring. That's a wonderful concept. I think. I have a hard time envisioning myself retiring. But part of that, I have a hard time this thought of just sitting on a shelf and not doing anything. And I think most of you would feel that way. That you're not prepared to simply sit back and watch. That you still want to be a part of what it is that God's doing. I have a pastor I was preaching for in the state of Florida. He said to me one day in a fit of frustration. I don't think he was totally sanctified at the moment. (laughs) He said, may God deliver me. For many more retired preachers and Sunday school teachers and former deacons who retire and move to my city. (laughs) He said, I have a church full of people who said, we've already done it, been there, done that, and don't want to do it anymore. (laughs) An incredible, I remember preaching a meeting one time in a church that the area was full of retired Pentecostal preachers. We had like 12 or 13 of them every night in the meeting. You know, I mean, I was a young kid, got all these guys, 65, 70, 80, 85, and some of these guys, you know, have been in ministry for 55, 60 years. And I thought, wow, what an opportunity. So I formed a fire tunnel and got all of them up. I counted the years. I figured we were somewhere in the neighborhood of almost a thousand years of anointing. I said, folks, we're going to go through this fire tunnel. So we're going to have a thousand years of anointing lay hands on you. Those guys are having more fun. And one of my favorite, one of my favorite members, a man in that group that laid hands on me when I was ordained. And I watched this guy who was somewhere in his 80s at the time, down on his face, on his belly, leading a 14-year-old kid to the baptism in the Holy Spirit. He wasn't done yet. 
He couldn't travel like he used to and couldn't preach and do some of the stuff he used to do, but he wasn't done yet. And uh, in fact, they, they got so excited, they came out of retirement. A whole bunch of them. They formed what they called the Dream Team. <laughs> and they, they, started, they started booking meetings in area churches. Now, you know, they weren't going to travel hundreds of miles. They didn't have that physical, but they could travel 30, 40, 50, you know, minutes to some place. And, and, they, would, and, and, they, and they knew they couldn't all preach every night, so they were taking turns. You also had enough energy to preach once a week, you know. And so, and they would, they would, some, one would sing and one would preach and then they would pray. They were having so much fun. And churches were exploding with moves of God. Because they said, we're not done yet. We're not done yet. This nation needs revival and it needs you. It needs you to own it. It needs you to say, God, it hasn't come yet and I'm not letting go until it does. The second point, I haven't been anywhere near my notes, but the second point that God said, I mean, this was the uncomfortable one. Rend your heart. Now, the own your own revival, you know, I've noticed if I, when I talk about that in New Zealand, that usually doesn't create too much issue. Rod, just plug your ears for a moment, okay? Because I would say, you know, we don't want one of those Aussie things, and I could, yeah, amen, you know. We know all those American things. What a God thing. There you go. But the next part, rend your heart. Because it didn't take me too long in New Zealand to learn the truth that confrontation in New Zealand, those are two words that don't go in the same sentence. You know, being confrontational is not what we are known for. In fact, I discovered, and I kind of mentioned it the last night or the other night, that the a typical altar call, and I, I say this to New Zealand preachers all the time, the typical altar call in a New Zealand church on a Sunday morning, if you like to think about the possibility of considering <laughs> giving your life to Jesus, you may want to ring the church offices this week. Get an appointment to talk with one of our pastors about your spiritual welfare. I've had pastors fall off of seats. And they say, you got us. You got us. Because that's not exactly you know, what we're known for. Now, I didn't know that when I came. And so I... <laughs> it took me a while to learn that. I'm, you know, I'm doing this. I'm counting to three. And when I get to three, you know, every person in this room that you are not living for Jesus, you know, and one. <laughs> I'm counting to, and the three people are hitting the altars. And pastors are going. Of course, they said, well, you can get away with that. You're a crazy American. <laughs> in fact, I asked one, I said, you know, I said, if I, if I get my residency in New Zealand, do I have to behave myself? I said, well, I expected to conduct myself like a Kiwi preacher. They said, just don't lose your accent. <laughs> what does it mean to rend your heart? So I did a word study. And I discovered that word that appears in Joel on rend, for rend your heart, that that same word appears something like 63 times in the Old Testament. I knew that Evan Roberts had prayed Isaiah 64.1 as one of the key prayers and scriptures of the Welsh revival. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, thou wouldest come down, that the mountain might flow down at thy presence. That it was the concept of God tearing open the heavens that is linked so strongly to major revival and transformation. You see, I tell people all the time, what I'm after is something that is so big that I can't possibly create it. That what you're after is something so big that we cannot lay its cause at the feet of human personality. But something that is so big, you can only say, God tore the heavens open. So, and that's why when just two, three years ago, you said to me that God has really spoken to you about the first wave coming through, through Wellington, how many people would be, and the sort of numbers that you were saying is, it's kind of out there. 
The sort of stuff that God has to tear the heavens open for that to take place. So I understood that this thought of rending has to do with ripping things open and God tearing the, the heavens open and coming down among us. For those who may not be familiar with this concept, let me just run some of the other references. Frequently, most frequently, the word rend occurs as a part of a heartfelt and grievous affliction, usually accompanied by tearing one's upper garments in front of their heart, uh, bearing the sorrow of the heart. Theological word book of the Old Testament. 36 of those appearances is linked to rending or tearing the clothes as the outward sign of grief, mourning, repentance, humility. Joshua chapter 7 verse 6. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide. He and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. He's mourning and expressing his distress over the defeat of the armies of Israel at the city of Ai. It would be legitimate to say when a nation has been defeated in a time of war, it's time to fall on our face before God, let our hearts be torn before Him. But may I also say, when the church is not victorious, and I'm not speaking about the building on the corner of Main and Fifth, I'm talking about the body of Christ, is not victorious over the forces of darkness. It's time for we in the church to fall on our faces before God in repentance and weeping. I was inquiring of a pastor roughly my age, makes him a very young man. Okay, for those who are wondering, I'm 57. I was with a pastor roughly my age, and he got talking about the New Zealand of his youth. 40, 45, 50 years earlier. And he said, you know, he said, in the school that I grew up in, in the town I grew up in, this happened to be on the South Island, he said, I don't suppose that I could have named a dozen students in the entire school system that were unchurched. So they maybe weren't saved, but they were in church. He said, everybody was in church. Fast forward that now, and I'm sitting on a train between Picton and Christ Church, and a young lady across from me recognizes that the accent was not Kiwi. I tried my best to hide it. <laughs> You're here on holiday? Not exactly. <laughs> why are you here? Ask an evangelist why he's here. That is an open door. <laughs> you can drive a Mack truck through that door. So I began telling her why I was here. She was probably 21, 22 years of age tops. And she said something to me I will never forget. First, she apologized to me that I was wasting my time in New Zealand. Because nobody goes to church in New Zealand. And then she went on to say to me that she did not know personally anybody her age who went to church. She had been to Jewish synagogue a few times with her father. But then she added this line, but every one of my friends is on a desperate search for reality. But we have decided that the church is irrelevant. From everybody in my school attends church. To within a generation, I know nobody who attends church. I begin to change into some of the focus of my praying. I begin to pray a lot for that group of young people. And over the next few years, I can tell you that I have seen an awful lot of young people coming into the kingdom of God. And, and for those who are pronouncing the doom of the church in New Zealand, they're their forecast is way overrated. That there is something that God is doing among young people in this nation. The future is not bleak. But the future is not guaranteed. Because see, I live with an understanding. There are certain promises of God's word that are unconditional. It doesn't make a difference what you do. He's going to do it. 
In the fullness of time, God sent His Son. He didn't really matter what Rome said. God said, I'm sending Him. And there will come a day that the Father will say to the angel of the trumpet, it's time. But there's an awful lot of promises and prophecies in God's Word that are very conditional. If my people, then. There is no then until there is an if. The wonderful promise of salvation. No promise could be any greater than the promise given to you and I of salvation. But it is conditional. I must repent. I must believe. If I do not do that, if I do not repent, if I do not believe, if I do not ask Jesus, then that wonderful promise does not become mine. It's a conditional promise. You see, God is going to send revival. It's His promise. But specific locations become conditional. And God has given some incredible promises to this nation. In fact, I would tell you I've heard promises to this nation I have never heard over the states. In fact, I would tell you to, to your credit, I listen to people in New Zealand and, and you talk about winning the nation. I don't know if I've ever heard anybody in the states talk about winning the nation. We're starting to figure out what to do with our cities. You know, most pastors, they'll just try and figure out how to get the guy that's going to the church next door. You know, and, uh, and I, hear, I hear Kiwis talk about God's going to give us the nation. God's sending revival to the... But it's conditional. It's conditional. Credible promise that God gave to Smith Wigglesworth. Many of you have lived with that for years in prayer. Promise that God's given to others. Some of you in your local county. In fact, if I have heard it any place, I've heard it already this morning. Uh, if I've heard it one time in New Zealand, I've heard it every region I've been in in this nation preaching. God has promised to start revival in this region. What does that mean? Probably means it's going to explode all over the place and nobody will actually be able to determine where it started. They'll all just think it started where they were at, but God said, I just breathed. But the promises I want to submit to us, we have a part to play. Not only owning it, but this thing of rending. In 1 Kings 21 and 27, it came to pass when Ahab heard these words that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. That's an encouraging verse to me. Because Ahab, who represents absolutely everything wicked and vile, I mean, you just say Ahab and Jezebel, it sends chills up and down people's backbones. And yet when he rends his heart before God, here's what God says. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, See how Ahab humbles himself before me? Because he humbles himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's, son's days. If God will respond to a wicked king, who rends his heart, how much more will God respond to the cry of his children who rend their hearts? Second Kings 22 and 11, it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. And, and, and then it goes on, the prophet says to him in verse 19, because I heart, I'm sorry, verse 20, the prophet says this, because I heart was tender and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord when thou heardest what I spake against this place and against the inhabitants thereof that thou shouldest become a desolation and a curse hast rent thy clothes and wept before me I have also heard thee says the Lord as King Josiah hears the word of God and how they had violated it he expresses his repentance and grief over their sin with the rending of his clothes and the rending in part was a part of the national revival that followed it occurs again in Ezra 9, 3 and 5. Ezra becomes aware of the sins of the people. He begins to rend his clothes in anguish at their sin. Eight or nine verses, depending how you count them. Link rending with the tearing of a kingdom away from one person and giving that kingdom to another. And it is fair to say that this happened because they would not rend their hearts before God. 
And because they would not, God said, I'll take the kingdom away from you. And I will give the kingdom to another individual. If I understand the flow, the usage of rending uh, in terms of it being related mostly to repentance, uh, to grieving, to mourning, to humility, then it seems to me that the thrust of the word uh, that I felt came from the Lord for me to share with New Zealand is a call to repentance. A call to humbling ourselves before the Lord. In our text, I notice the following related concepts. Turning to the Lord with all of the heart. Turning to the Lord of necessity has always involved the turning away from sin. You can't have Jesus and sin both. It's not how close to the world can I walk and still have a move of God. My heart was broke again this week. I picked up a, a national publication online in the States. Christian publication. And I, was, I was reading... A, a, a blog by the owner of that publication and he was talking about two very, very well-known and visible ministers in the state who uh, the reputations have been tainted at best. And he talks about his encounters with them and years ago God giving him a word to, to share with the one about an issue in his life and, and watching what has transpired and taken place. And, and, and the double tragedy was he, he tells the story that just that week that individual had, had been arrested in a city for driving under the influence of alcohol. One of the key spiritual leaders and his influence totally dissipated. Somewhere there's a separation between the sin, the lifestyle of the ungodly. And living the way that God calls us to live if we're going to impact our society. It involves turning to the Lord and turning away from sin. No halfway measures. All of our hearts. It involves fasting. I cannot tell you to fast, but it may well be. They're coming out of these days together that God may speak to some of our hearts to begin to regularly, systematically again set aside days to fast and to pray for the heavens to be rent over our cities, the heavens to be rent over our chapters, the heavens to be rent over the regions we live in, to regularly, systematically say, God, I will set this day aside and I will pray until. Hallelujah. It may involve weeping. It involve mourning. John Calvin says this was wailing. It's being so moved by the situation that we respond beyond our cultural and religious boundaries. Now please hear me. I am not issuing a call for emotionalism. I am aware that Americans tend to be more out there <laughs> than Kiwis. I've learned a little bit in 10 years, 11 years. But when I am more deeply moved over the loss of a rugby game, and I know that's our national religion, and I was stunned when we did not advance further in the last World's Cup and a job was maintained. <laughs> Some of you catch that later. I've said to people in the States, I said, you just think we're crazy about sports in the States. I said, New Zealand's the only place in the world that your team can go to the national, to go to the world finals and take second, and you're the coach, you get fired. <laughs> it's because we're not supposed to take second. I've, um, I enjoy rugby, by the way. Cricket, I don't understand. I don't think anybody understands cricket. I don't care what they say. But when I'm more disturbed over the failure of the all black than I am over the sin of the nation, something is out of priority in my life. When I'm more disturbed over what happens on that field than about what happens in the marketplace of people's lives as a child of God. When I'm more deeply... You get the point. When it's proper to weep at a movie... But wrong to weep in God's house. Something's wrong. In Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 30, God challenges the people who were ready to rend their face to secure the help of Egypt. 
but would not rend their hearts to secure the help of God. I read you the verse. And when thou art spoiled, what wilt thou do? Though thou clothest thyself with crimson, though thou deckest thee with ornaments of gold, though thou rentest thy face with painting, in vain shalt thou make thyself fair. Thy lovers will despise thee. They will seek thy life. This fourth chapter of Jeremiah describes the coming invasion by the Babylonians. The situation calls for the people of God to return to the Lord. But instead, in verse 30, they're described as a woman trying to make herself more attractive for a lover. Some see it like a prostitute preparing to go to the street. Thou rentest thy face with painting is translated in the NIV and other translations this way. Why shade your eyes with paint? In fact, let me read you the verse in the NIV because I think it makes it far more clear. What are you doing, O devastated one? Why dress yourself in scarlet and put on jewels of gold? Why shade your eyes with paint? You adorn yourself in vain. Your lovers despise you. They seek your life. Could it be that often when the time has grown desperate, the church has dressed itself for getting the attention of Egypt rather than rending its heart before the Lord? The programs of flesh have not transformed our cities. And they're not changing people's lives. Is it not time for us to seek the Lord? It involved the rending of the hearts, not the garments. This was not to be an outward religious show of repentance. Oh yes, the second chapter of call would go forth for national fasting and repentance. They were to blow the trumpet in Zion. They were to sanctify a fast, call the solemn assembly, gather the people together, including the elders and and the children and and the babies. Honeymoons would be delayed as the bridegroom was to go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. The priests, the ministers of the Lord were to come and they were to lead the way in weeping between the porch and the altar. They were to call out to God for His mercy and intervention. All this was to be done with the hope that the rending of the heart would cause God to rend the heavens and maybe He would return and repent and leave a blessing behind. I was first drawn to Joel chapter 2, not on that flight, but I was in the southern part of Argentina, the Patagonia region, and we had uh, been ministering that day in the public schools, and that evening we were doing a public service, and the team was setting up for the service, and I had gone to a side room to pray, and, and I, I heard myself saying these words. I, I really hadn't planned it. It wasn't a thought-out prayer. I just heard myself saying, do it again, Lord. Do it again. No, no idea why, but it just kept coming, do it again, Lord. Do it again. And then in that side room, I, I saw a listing of verses of Scripture on a marker board. And, and Joel chapter 2, verse 13, just kind of jumped off the board at me. And I didn't know what it said. So I, I found a Bible, and I turned to it, and, and I read these words about rending the heart and, and not the garments. But it wasn't until after the meeting I understood what God was trying to say to me. We had a wonderful meeting that night. I, I preached a very simple straightforward gospel message. I took the book of Romans, walked just through the Romans road to salvation that you've used in personal witnessing. I did it publicly and, and four young people got saved that night and it was, a, it was a wonderful time. But after the meeting, two elderly ladies, school teachers, retired, mid-80s, said, young man, I like that, young man. I said, we don't know why we're telling you this, but we thought you'd be interested in knowing this. The chapel across the street from the school that you spoke at this morning is where the Welsh revival, when it came across the Atlantic Ocean and came to Argentina, because Argentina in that area had a large Welsh community. He said, when it came across the Atlantic Ocean... The spark for revival started in that chapel across the street from the school that you were speaking at. But the epicenter 
of the Welsh revival in Argentina was in this chapel that you spoke in tonight. And I remembered the prayer God had given me. Do it again, Lord. Do it again. And it was then the first time I ever heard him say to me, but until you rend your heart, I cannot rend the heavens. If my heart remains brass, so will the heavens. But when my heart becomes open and rent and pliable before him, then the heavens become open. And there is a certain rending of the heart that I understand that only God creates. I'm not calling for emotionalism, but I'm calling for an openness before God. He says, God, I want to feel what you feel. I want to feel, God, what you feel for the lost. I prayed that for years. God, I want to feel what you feel. I didn't realize what I was getting myself in for. Until there be moments in giving an invitation that I thought my heart was absolutely going to shatter. The pain that I would experience as I give the invitation and, and people would be coming but knowing there were others and recognizing I was experiencing a pain that was not something I could create. Indeed, had I realized what it was, I probably would have never asked for it. But I do find myself saying, God, I want that again. I want to feel what you feel. It's the friend of mine coming out of the revival in Brownsville back in the mid-90s, driving down a, a motorway in the States between two major cities. He said, uh, as I was driving, he said, every car that came past me, said, my heart began to break over the inhabitants of that car and their spiritual condition. I found myself weeping over people I didn't know. He said, the closer I got to the major city, he saying, oh God, please lift this. He said, because if you don't lift this, God, the traffic in the city is going to kill me. He said, my heart won't be able to take it. Rend my heart, Lord. Something about the rending of our hearts before him that God's attracted to. I don't understand why that is so, but it is so. In Hosea chapter 13, verse 8, the expression appears again. I'm, I'm trying to bring this to a wrap up. I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved of her whelps, will rend the call of their heart, and there will I devour them like a lion. The wild beast shall tear them. It's a part of the coming judgment on a sinful people. The prophet describes Hosea 13, the actions of the Lord, as being like a lion, a leopard, and a bear. The part that directly relates to us is the bear. In one sense, the use of the three wild animals is probably a visual of the extremities of the judgment that was coming. But notice the specific thing the bear would do. Rend the call of the heart. Tear open their chest, New American Standard. The sense seems to be that since the people of God would not turn from their sins, since they would not rend their hearts, then God himself would cause their hearts to be rent open in judgment. I love to celebrate the goodness of what God does. In fact, the first time God said to me, I want you to preach this to the city. We were doing a citywide gathering of the churches. I had been preaching around Robin meeting in Hutt Valley. And um, we were doing one night that all the churches were coming together, got a venue, we were going to celebrate. I said, Lord, he said, I want you to preach this. I said, Lord, this is the night to celebrate. I don't want to preach this. <laughs> the seasons of celebration are right. They're proper. We need them. There are times to laugh and shout and dance about. And I love to do that. Ever since God touched me in revival, I can't keep my feet still. I mean, I go to church and I just, I just got to move. It's just something that happened in my, in my heart and my spirit. I love the celebration. I love to shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. But there are also seasons before God that it's not the season to shout, it's the season to rend the hearts. I was fascinated. In reading Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 7, this expression, a time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. Now, I always read that verse of Scripture as a beautiful expression of poetry describing the seasons in our lives. And it is that. But I was stunned 
when I read the comments by John Gill. Now, John Gill followed Charles Spurgeon. For those of you that are church historians, uh, you know that Charles Spurgeon passed one of the great, great churches of all time in the city of London, and uh, 5,000 people at the age of 23. And, uh, and, and at the close of his career, that John Gill became the pastor of that great church. Uh, and, and John Gill writes in this verse of Scripture, he says this, uh, He links the time to rend with the times in the life of the church where repentance and mourning are called for. The time to sow, he links to the times of sewing together the garments that have been rent during the repentance. In other words, when the seasons of repentance were over, when the revival had broken, then it was time to sow. The weeping was over, the time to laugh had come. People would often ask why Evan Roberts, who was the leading figure in the Welsh revival, why he laughed so much when he ministered. And I've been in the church where that meeting was held. My wife and I were, had the privilege of being in Wales. and We actually just come from the Philippines where I lost my voice and I couldn't speak. My wife said it was wonderful. <laughs> we had 10 days in England where I couldn't talk to any preachers. I couldn't be on the telephone to anybody. She said for 10 days she had me totally and completely to herself. But during that time, we went to Wales and stood in that chapel. And I stood in that pulpit and, oh God, it's something of that anointing. And Evan Roberts would laugh. He was full of joy when he would preach. And people want to know because that was so outside of the way church was done. But what some did not realize is that for months before the revival, as the Spirit of God would visit Evan Roberts in the night hours and he would lay in his bed weeping and shaking and sometimes the whole bed would begin to shake under the presence of God and his brother would say, Evan, are you all right? And Evan would say to his brother, can you believe God with me for 100,000 people to get saved? And depending which church historian you believe, somewhere between six months and two years, 100,000 people gave their lives to Jesus in Wales. The opening service, there was 12 people in attendance. The pastor of the church was so excited about Evan's sense that God wanted to use him to speak. He said, Evan, yes, you may speak after the service is over. <laughs> this is the literal truth. He said, when we're done with the midweek study, he said, all of those who would like to stay and hear Evan speak, he's going to go into the Sunday school room. And you can go over and listen to him. And the opening night of the Welsh Revival began with 12 people <laughs> in a Sunday school room. And 100,000 people later, because God found somebody who would rend their hearts before God. Until. I've often said, God, why is it so long? Revival yesterday, God, but it been good. Day before would have been better. And we've been crying out for years. Why? And every now and then I get this, kind of this ongoing prophetic word. If, if there is a repeating word that I've heard now many, many, many times over the years, it's, it's basically this. And I heard again just the other day. You haven't seen anything yet. The first time I heard that, forgive me for sounding egotistical, but I said to the Lord, Lord, you know what I've been seeing? I mean, God, do you understand what we've been, like God didn't understand? You do know, by the way, when God asks you a question, He is not looking for information. <laughs> you, know? you know? Isn't it amazing how many things we tell God that we think He doesn't know? But one day when I taught Him, He said, do you know how... He said, it takes a long time to put the scaffolding up for a big building. And the bigger the building, the deeper the foundation. And, he, and basically, let me know that what I am building is huge. And it takes time. But he's still looking for those who are in their hearts with him. That he can bring to pass this thing. Let me close. For the moment that the invitation came to share this time with you, 
I think my wife can verify this. There's very few meetings I've ever approached with a greater sense of combination, anticipation, and dread. Because the last thing I ever want to do is be offensive to anybody. But I was saying to friends who were praying, I said, I want to go confront. I want to do it with the right spirit. But I want to get in the face of men, women, good men, godly men. Men have been leaders in the nation. And I'm going to ask them to pick up the baton again. Even while I've been here, some of you have talked to me about how you came into the kingdom of God and the charismatic renewal. The impact, the punch of full gospel in, in your life that, that sees the whole impact of the charismatic renewal and some huge names that God used in this nation. I don't take any assignment lightly. And my wife can verify to you that there are a lot of services when it's over, I just go somewhere and I weep. I say, God, did I say it right? Did I accurately communicate what you're trying to say? Gentlemen, I want to call you back to the front lines. I want to call you back to saying we are not done. We're not done interceding. We're not done fasting. We're not done working. As long as there is breath in this body, we're going to work. We're going to believe. We're going to go after God until revival comes to this nation. We are not going to be satisfied to believe what the naysayers tell us when they say that. As I've had them say, a friend of mine was speaking in this nation and, they, and, and he was having breakfast at a hotel and they said, what do you hear? He said, I'm speaking at a conference. And they said, Damn, well, nobody in New Zealand goes to church. Another friend of mine, Kiwi friend of mine, he was gathering wood and, and, and got talking to the guy about what he did. And he's a pastor. And this friend, the guy said, well, in 20 years, nobody will go to church in New Zealand. I said, well, if Jesus has come before that, that may be true. I said, but count on it. God's heart is to send something so big to this nation. We need you. And I'm going to ask you to ask God to prepare you afresh and anew for what it is He wants to do. I don't know what your role will be personally. I don't know what your assignment will be. I know that every one of us got to say, I need some prayer warriors. There are God moments that God gives us to witness to people around us. You say, I often say to people, winning the whole world is not really mathematically that difficult. One person a year doubled every year. You see, if nobody in the whole world, Jimmy, knew Jesus, and I led you to Jesus, and after one year I had two people in my church, you and me, this chapter's not going anywhere very fast. But the next year both of us found one man and led him to Jesus. We had four of us. The next year be eight of us. The next year, 16. The next year, 32. 64. 128. 256. 512. Let me round it. 1,000. 2,000. 4,000. 8,000. 16,000. 32,000. You can go home and run the numbers in your computer, but about year 34, it hits 8 billion. That's one person a year. Do you think you know one person? that maybe God could help you to win that person to Jesus and disciple them. And we're not starting at ground zero. We can cut that way down without television. I have nothing against television. I speak on it from time to time. Without radio, I've done radio. Just one man to another man. One woman to another woman, lead them to Jesus, disciple them, repeat it. Lead them to Jesus, disciple them, and repeat it. This nation can be won to Him by the power 
of his Holy Spirit flowing through you. I'm going to ask you to do more than let full gospel businessmen become a retired man's club. But make it a senior citizen's army. Listen, I learned a few things as a pastor. First, I learned by accident. I was 24. I was the senior pastor of the church. Is that scary or what? I had a class in my church of elderly ladies, about 50 of them, all above the age of 65. When you're 24, everybody above 65 looks identical. You know, so by sheer desperation, I decided to do visits in the homes of these ladies so I could figure out who they were. I had no idea that I was being led by the Holy Spirit. Because what I didn't realize was every one of those ladies was somebody's grandma. Here's what I discovered, Mike. If grandma likes you, everybody likes you. If grandma doesn't like you, you're dead in the water, man. You know, I like to say it was my ingenuity. It was desperation. But I got to know grandma. And I discovered something. When grandma started to pray, it's over, folks. It's a done deal. And when grandpa joins her, Enemy can just pack up his bags. It's over. And I want to call you to once again to the front to lead in prayer, bold witnessing. God, give us New Salem. Stand with me. My wife asked me this morning, how are you feeling? And I told her, I'm terrified, I'm edgy. I'm... As I said, there are moments with this one. I'm comfortable when I know that I know that I know that I have a word from the Lord. I never considered myself a prophet. I've had that label handed to me. I've also been called a pastor, a teacher, a Evangelist and apostle, so I don't know what I am. Somebody asked me the other day, you know, I said, I'm your average, ordinary, run of the mill, nothing unusual, go straight for the throat. Pentecostal preacher. But I said to her, my problem always at this moment is, what do I do at the altar, Lord? Because you see, what I'm after is bigger than the next few moments. I love to lay hands on you. I love to say, God, let me lay hands on people and impart something from you like you put into me. But ultimately, it's bigger than that because what I'm after this morning is what's going to happen three months from now. On a cold two months from now, on a cold August in Otago, you don't feel like getting up and fasting that day. What I'm after is what's taking place six months from now. There hasn't been any break yet in your chapter. And the naysayers are telling you just close the doors. It's that thing that God puts inside of your spirit that in six months, a year from now, something has begun to change because you have rent your hearts and God has seen it. And God says, now. So what I want to do, Holy Spirit, I want to bless these friends. I want to encourage them. I want them to know they can do it. For the DNA deep inside of them 
We have a generation in this nation that has grown up, Father, and they don't know genuine moves of God, many of them. But in front of me, there's a group that they came out of that fire. And Father, I don't know how to go about this, but I am asking that you would ignite something in our spirits. That not just the emotion of these next few moments. And I'm happy, Father, if you sweep into this place and lunch doesn't happen because we are just lost in you. Where I'm happy, Father, if we walk out of these doors in three minutes and go enjoy a wonderful time of fellowship. But if you will birth something inside of us, then we will look back at Jesus tarries and in the heat of revival. Who say, I remember a Sunday morning, Ridges Hotel, when I made a commitment, I'm going to own it. I'm going to own it.